Well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Hello, folks. Today we are joined by Christina Strait and Evelyn Kent, both experts in space vehicles, to discuss Miyazaki films, satellite operations, and our new favorite satellite, Carl. In three, two, one. Chris and Evie, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and no pressure. We're just gonna start this off really tough. So, you know, in a research organization, we love data. And according to a study from 2016 at NPR One, most of our podcast listeners that are on the you know other side of this uh, virtual platform we have right now, 20 to 35% of them will drop off in the first five minutes if we don't get this right. Oh no. <laughs> No a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah. So one of the uh, fun tidbits we had from our pre-interview was you were talking about how satellites can have different personalities. I don't know. Are we talking about Enneagrams or Myers-Briggs? You know, I'm personally an ENFP. Do you have some moody satellites out there? Uh, so it, it's funny that you ask that because we talk about them having personalities, but um in reality, very few of them have, you know, sweet, quiet, calm personalities. They tend to be more on the kind of occasionally cranky side, um, maybe a little feisty. And it's kind of a joke amongst operators that they, you know, they just have that kind of those quirks and that kind of personality. They tend to challenge us and they tend to do it at crazy times, like 2 a.m. on Saturday. And it, it's because, you know, they're our satellites are complex machines operating in a harsh environment, and they do occasionally run into issues. They're all custom built. Uh, most of the ones we fly at AFRL are single string. They're unique. They don't necessarily have a lot of redundant components. So it's very normal for you occasionally to have a component fail on orbit or on launch or um, for your vehicle to reboot. But um, when they do that to you, you know, in the middle of the night, again, on a Saturday, or on a holiday, you kind of feel like the satellite is trying to test you. So that's why we like to say they have personalities. And that's something that uh, we kind of discussed last time as well in our pre-interview is talking about these fun personalities and these challenges and something I'd brought up and wasn't sure if maybe this is changing. Uh, I know we'd asked before if you ever gave these satellites fun names like, you know, Carl or, or Debbie. I uh, wasn't sure if like, oh, old Carl's up there acting up again. Let's, let's send, uh, you know, see if somebody can help out with the programming. Like, I, I know you mentioned that may not be common, but after our <laughs> conversation, is that going to be a new practice? It might have to be a new practice. The one we have in orbit right now definitely has a cranky old man personality. So Carl would be very perfect for that one. I was going to say, so you have to wake up at 2 a.m. and be like, hey, I got to go feed Carl again. Yes, exactly. Carl is acting up tonight. But if we can help with that, I'm glad that at least if we can have a little impact on these satellites, giving a name like Carl, I'm glad we could help. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, taking a step back then, um, I know that we kind of have a good idea of these personalities and these fun kind of names you might have for satellites, but we kind of want to know how you guys got to this point. So kicking things off, starting with Evelyn, what was your journey like to get to our Space Vehicles Directorate? Like many uh, people, I think these days, uh, I was very interested in space since a very early age. I always knew I wanted to do something in space. I would have loved to become an, an astronaut, but uh, when it started to come time to look for college, I was getting my brain back to reality, looking for programs that would get me into the space industry. How do you get into the space industry to start with? And I was looking, this was in like 2008, so there were very few colleges that had um, a university run satellite program. One of those was the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. It's all cadet run and it was a defense funded mission, the Southeast Act program there. So that's how I ended up at the Air Force Academy and the Air Force. And then from there, uh, I got a master's degree through a fellowship with the National Reconnaissance Office or the NRO. Um, that was at uh, the Air Force Institute of Technology, which is at um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Um, and that had a direct follow on from the master's degree in astronautical engineering straight to the National Reconnaissance Program Office. And then from there, because for uh, engineers in the Air Force, they want you to do a program office operations experience and other experience within your first five years or so. So I managed to swing a operations job at the National Reconnaissance Office after the program office job there. 
Um, and then I just had to hit the other experience. So that's why I targeted AFRL. Um, a mentor of mine at the NRO uh, knew someone here at AFRL Space Vehicles that was working on research in space. And I, I did a minor in Japanese at the academy. So um, my mentor knew that this person was working um, with, uh, you know, he was networking with people in Japan sometimes as well. So uh, that was a possible opportunity here. So I, that's how I ended up here at AFRL. And then I liked my job so much here that luckily I got offered a job as a civilian and decided to stick around. That's super cool. Have you been able to use your Japanese skills yet? Or uh, have you explored, you know, our Air Force Office of Scientific Research with a location in Tokyo? I was really interested in doing the engineer and scientist exchange program for a long time. And I think I could still do that as a civilian in the future. But kind of since having kids, that train has kind of come and gone. Um, I did get to go to Japan about 10 times so far, just on cultural exchanges and learning. And most of that, I think all but two trips were funded by the Air Force for me. So that was fun. Wow. That's cool. We need to figure that out, kid. <laughs> I totally agree. That'd be cool. And I, I totally promised I wouldn't do any left field questions, but this does present one. <laughs> so I have a, I sort of see. Um, so having a lot of cultural exchanges and getting a chance to travel to uh, Japan, um, do you have any favorite, like, again, kind of off the top or mo main topic here, but any favorite like films or directors from Japan that have really either inspired you or you really enjoy? Like, for instance, I'm a huge Akira Kurosawa fan. Like, I just watched Seven Samurai for the mm. first time and it blew my mind. Yeah, the samurai movies are great. I'm actually a huge anime fan, and Hayao Miyazaki has the best films, and I'm so happy that um, for HBO Max, because they have all of his films now from uh, Studio Ghibli. That's kind of like the Disney of Japan. So that's the most amazing one to me. Oh, I totally agree. Uh, my favorite, Princess Mononoke, is still one of my favorite films of all time. And uh, my fiance oh, yeah. and I watch Miyazaki on the rake, like for her birthday. We usually make a um, uh, permission <laughs> to do that. So that that's uh, really cool. So another question with that then, uh, Miyazaki, he is a, a, a as you know, a um, huge aviation history fan. Uh, a lot of his films touch on that. So has that been kind of an insp inspiring force for you, like watching some of his films, seeing his love of aviation? Actually, I did not know that. Um, while I was in Japan, I did a semester abroad in Japan during my time at the academy. I was actually at the Japanese Military Academy. And um, I think it was actually his son's movie came out. And I thought they were huge into like naval stuff because a lot of their movies are about boats like Ponyo. And um, I don't remember the name of the one that came out while I was there, but it was all about boats. So I didn't know that about aviation with him. <laughs> Yeah, um, that, that's really cool. It's a good point, too, because a lot of, um, I know, Japanese history, Miyazaki and his son obviously dive into being animators that lived through a lot of it. But um, I know there's, um, goodness gracious me, I'll have to look up the film and what it's called. But more recently, he released one that talked about his love of aviation. So um, I'll have to plug it your way if you haven't seen it. And I'll definitely have to check out some that you recommend. That, that's really cool. Very cool. Thanks. And uh, speaking of great stuff that we did to get us to this point, switching gears here, uh, Chris, what connected you with um, the Space Vehicles Directorate here at AFRL? That's kind of an interesting story. I graduated from the University of Florida with degree, a degree in aerospace engineering. And um, for aerospace engineers, our degrees are kind of a hybrid of air and space engineering, right? The space had always been my passion and had always been what really interested me. So I didn't have a job when I graduated. Um, I went back home and worked at Hanson Air Force Base for a little while, and then I heard about the Palace Acquirer program, and I found out that there were positions here at Kirtland, which was really exciting, um, in the Space Vehicles Directory. So I applied for the program and was accepted, and um, this is a civilian program, actually, that's still running, and it's, it's a really fantastic opportunity because they pay for it's a three-year internship, with grades of step upwards, and then you have one year of full-time school paid for, um, including books and tuition, so that was amazing. So after I came down and worked at Kirtland for a little while, and then I got to go to CU Boulder and get my master's degree, and the Air Force took care of all of it, which was really fantastic. Um, I could just concentrate on getting my master's, not worry about trying to work or you know be an RA. I could just completely do it, and I think that's the only way that I could have gotten it done because I only had three semesters to do it. So it was a really great opportunity. And then after that, I came back down here to Kirtland and I've been working in space vehicles ever since. So how cool both of you had, you know, the Air Force and different paths, whether civilian active duty, pay for your schooling 
And now you're both at the Space Vehicles Directorate at Kirtland Air Force Base, which is in New Mexico. I, what do you do there besides, you know, babysit Carl? <laughs> um, so I guess to give to give our answer context, let's start with our division. So our division is called the Integrated Experiments and Evaluation Division, and we do the full site life cycle of our space vehicles um, for all of our all of the space experiments or many of the space experiments coming out of our directorate. So our division does um, design, building, integration, and test. We're involved with the contractors and some of it we actually do ourselves for some of the missions. And then we're involved in the on-orbit experiment operations ourselves. And um, many of our vehicles or most of our vehicles are initiated by our directorate, but it's common for us to partner or we have mixed experiments from different places on a single vehicle. And we fly everything from CubeSats, which are just, um, you know, shoebox size to thousand kilogram class vehicles. So, you know, obviously a lot larger than that. And um, for the larger vehicles, we usually partner with the Space and Missile Systems Center, and we fly them down the street in their operations facility, which is called the RSC. So within our division, we are a team of four, plus one part-time reservist. We call our team the Ops Cadre, um, because we have a little bit of pride in our expertise and our you know, niche. And our team was founded to retain a core set of expertise in doing experimental satellite operations. So our mission is to continuously improve how the Space Vehicles Directorate does operations by retaining best practices, by um, retaining lessons learned, by teaching those to new generations of operators on new missions. So we can kind of continuously move the Directorate forward in what we can get out of these experiments. And we touch all areas of the mission life cycle. So when a program is being developed, we'll work with the program office to um, talk about requirements or talk about some of the vehicle constraints that a certain vehicle might have that we need to accommodate. Uh, we provide office expertise back to the program management office, uh, for example, when they're picking what kind of orbit they want for a mission. And, you know, they need to know the pros and cons and some of the kind of operational effects or influences of that, that particular orbit. And then we recruit and train operations crews. And we also serve, finally, last but not least, we serve in crew positions ourselves. It's a big mission. And it's really fascinating that we get to be involved with all areas of a, a mission's life cycle. It's also very challenging because um, the Space Vehicle Directorate is not an operational, like big O operational organization. So we don't have a lot of people who are kind of dedicated or chartered to doing operations full time. It's just a handful of us. So when we're putting together a crew for a new mission, we're recruiting personnel away from their day jobs um, at other places in the directorate or occasionally from our sister directorate. And they come, we borrow them part time and they come fill our crews. So it's a, there are pros and cons to this and it, it's a lot of work and training to put a crew together and make sure everything is ready for a mission to fly. So normally when I think about crews, I think about people going up into space, like uh, we had a more recent Crew Dragon, uh, you know, going up to the International Space Station. What do your crews look like? And, and what, what roles do they take on? You said that these are kind of additional duties from them to take them away from, you know, their primary day job. Yeah, so our crew, um, we're definitely a ground crew, and we're focused on everything that the satellite needs in order to um, be monitored and to get its mission done. So we're monitoring its health, we're pulling down data um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we're um, sending up commands every day to give it mission tasking, to turn the radio on, to talk to us for the next day, and um, it it definitely takes it takes a village. <laughs> it takes a lot of manpower because we like to keep an eye on them twenty four seven. So even though there are different people in there at different times, we we generally have a two man crew in there with Carl, um, keeping an eye on him day and night. 
I would also add to that that um, it's a good point you mentioned about um, the crew going into space. I, I think that what we do is just as serious. And like if you go into an op center, especially in the middle of something like that we haven't done before, I, th- I think that the atmosphere is similar. Like everyone's kind of high stress. Everyone's staying quiet for concentration. And um, if we do something wrong, it could cause a problem in space. I'm glad you touched on that with Michelle mentioning the crew and you guys kind of explaining what yours does. Um, we, we touched on it earlier, talking about how important training is here, but I kind of want to go a bit deeper. Um, so what does that really look like? Again, having this full purview, like you mentioned, of like start to finish, um, cradle to grave for these satellites. Um, are you just training the people who are operating said satellite? Or are you doing every stage of this journey to ensure people are there and ready on call? We kind of do the whole cradle to grave package for putting together a crew Um, determining certification requirements, determining uh, when people need to be in the op for, and um, we do all of their training from start to finish. We train on the mission. We train on, you know, ops basics and things like that. Uh, We kind of do the whole package of putting all of it together so that we can be ready to fly the mission. Very cool. And in this training itself then, so is this something that um, you guys actually have, like, uh, do you send them off anywhere to train like this uh, space boot camp, if you will, or satellite boot camp? Or um, how does this actually work? We actually host the boot camp ourselves. We, so our, our team of four plus our part timer, we have a repository of training material. Um, we have a lot of other people who uh, work in the directorate or work in SNC nearby who have a lot of ops expertise. And we kind of pull them all together to provide full-scale rehearsals, full-scale uh, training events using simulators. We do classroom training. So, um, yeah, so we kind, of, we kind of host the boot camp here ourselves at Kirtland. That is super cool. Yeah, I was wondering if you guys actually had to send them anywhere. If, like you mentioned, everything really was in-house. And, and that does perfectly tie to a question I had that, again, we kind of touched on earlier, but uh, earlier, excuse me, but I'd love to hear more. Speaking of this training and kind of prepping to get a satellite up, what or how much goes into preparing a satellite before it goes um, up into space or into orbit? Like for these teams that are training, these simulations and simulators you mentioned, um, is that how you guys get a lot of the training on the ground set before you send it up? Or kind of uh, how do you properly stress test something like that before it uh, goes up uh, above our heads? So the integration and test teams that we have, um, they're the ones that are responsible for building and integrating the pieces of the vehicle. They have to test each piece part before assembling those. Um, to make sure that those parts are working correctly. And then when they assemble them together, they test those assemblies as well. Um, The vehicle hardware goes through uh, a lot of different types of testing, including environmental testing, which includes vibration testing, thermal testing, vacuum testing, as well as functional testing, just to like make sure does it turn on, does it turn, you know, do the things it's supposed to do. And then in addition to the hardware, we also thoroughly test the software. Um, And one way we do that on the ground is by sending commands to the flight computer and then confirming that we get the correct response back from the spacecraft. Um, And then testing the communication link is another important piece. We send data from the ops center through the antenna to the satellite and all the way back again to ensure that we can communicate with it. And we do that testing before launching. That way we know when it's in space that it should work properly and we'll be able to communicate with it. And the ultimate objective of all this testing is just to verify that the hardware and the software is going to get the mission done in the end. That is so cool. And I was going to ask, too, I know we touched on this in uh, our pre-interview with you guys, but I'm not sure if many people are familiar with this. Um, You mentioned quite a few types of testing for the satellite or different satellites, which makes sense. There's a lot these things are going to go through. Uh, You mentioned one that was, um, did you say, I may have got it wrong, but was it vibration or kind of you saw like this um, kind of testing? Yeah. What goes into that or why is that important? It makes sure that the components are going to survive. There's a lot of vibrations that go on. Like if you've been to a rocket launch, which actually I have not yet, that's on my bucket list. You know, you can feel the vibrations in your body. So I've heard when, as the rocket launches because it's so loud and powerful. Um, and so there's a lot of shaking that happens. And I can give you an example. When I was in grad school, I went through a design and build spacecraft class um, where we actually put hardware together and did all this testing in school. Um, and uh, when we put our spacecraft on the vibration table there, um, it's like a big table um, that you bolt down your spacecraft into, and it just shakes it really, really hard. Um, and when we did that, 
screws actually like unscrewed themselves, came all the way out and like pieces started like actually flying off of it. So um, that was a really good learning experience. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. I was thinking about that. Like engineering classes I did back in like high school, I remember making like, you know, toothpick bridges and stuff like that. And they mentioned if this thing knocks around too much, I mean, if you're not do this, if you don't do it right, it could be dangerous for people. And that was just, a <laughs> uh, so no, that makes sense. You really got to make sure you tighten those bolts, right? Cause, um, it's something that you think is just kind of common sense. Like, oh yeah, you got to make sure it all stays together on launch, but there's a lot of rigorous testing that goes behind it. And this kind of pulls back the veil there to show, uh, just how much your team has to do before those satellites go up. Speaking of you know, work your team does, I believe you were involved in the DSX launch um, back in June of 2019. Yeah, we were, and we are actually flying DSX on orbit right now. Super cool. So I am not a scientist or an engineer, but I did get to go to a launch. Uh, so I was there when the uh, Falcon Heavy launch um, went up with the STP-2 mission uh, that DSX was on, and, and the ground did shake. We were out like on a causeway on uh, at NASA. I was part of a NASA, NASA social event. It was really cool, and I hope you get the opportunity sometime because you deserve that more than me. <laughs> so, so you're flying DSX up there. I, I don't know if 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 it's a has a Carl like personality or anything. But what does DX stand for? What, what what's it like? What's its personality? DSX is definitely our Carl. It stands for Demonstration and Sciences Experiment. And it's got some very cool space weather experiments. And it also has an experiment exploring the processes that naturally clear out the radiation belt. So the results from that experiment will answer the question of whether we could develop technology to clean up an artificial radiation belt if that were to happen um, from a high altitude nuclear explosion. It's a very valuable endeavor, and we're proud of it because it's the largest unmanned structure on orbit right now. It has two 40-meter booms, so uh, Carl is over 80 meters in total, and the booms function as our very low-frequency transmitter antennas. DSX is a great example of a satellite with a personality, as we mentioned. Um, the idea was conceived in 2003, and the hardware started showing up a few years later, but we had launch slips and we had a change of our designated launch vehicle. So uh, DSX didn't get to launch until 2019. So that was, you know, a decade and a half. Um, so some of the hardware is over a decade old on the vehicle. So it's been a little bit challenging. It's, it's not really DSX's fault that <laughs> he's a little bit of a cranky old man. But um, despite that, we've been getting a lot of valuable science data from it, and we've conducted some joint experiments with other satellites transmitting to and from them. So it's a pretty cool mission. Super cool and huge. Oh, my goodness. Like, he's a large, cranky old man. So you said 80 meters. So that's yeah, uh, that's 260-ish feet, you know, so like, I don't know, almost two-thirds of a football field or, or longer. Yeah. Like his that's a that's a quite a, quite the wingspan it's a very large vehicle so yeah, no, that that is really, really cool to think about um, helping maintain and run that mission. Um, something we talked about earlier, your team has to work, you said, like 24 hours, like around the clock just to make sure the satellites, if they need help or you um, get a message like from these saying, hey, like we need a quick update or something. Um, how often do you actually have to give software updates or things like this to a, 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 a spacecraft like DSX? Is that like a monthly thing or just as necessary? I think to, um, to give you a good answer to that, it's important to make the distinction between, um, you know, the software that's always on board and then daily mission taskings, right? Because the vehicle needs to know, okay, what is my job today? What do I need to go out and do? And uh, when do I need to turn on and talk to the ground? So we do, um, every day we do updates for mission taskings that need to happen that day or the next day. Uh, we try to always be a day ahead. Um, you know, so that we're kind of more prepared and organized for that. Um, but we do do um, big software updates to the vehicles occasionally, maybe maybe a few times a year, or a handful of times, depending on what's going on. And that's usually to solve, you know, sometimes you get a little bug and it turns out to be something that you really need to correct because it's causing you time or it's causing you experiment, um, experiment time. So that is also something we do occasionally. And if we move from this big idea of like the DSX satellite to something really tiny, CubeSats, you mentioned them earlier. 
I hear about them all the time, but uh, if I didn't have a really good understanding of what they are, could you explain? Uh, yeah, CubeSats are a class of satellites that are, they range from the size of a shoebox to the size of like a small package. And they they often use commercial off-the-shelf parts. Um, they're getting more and more common these days. A lot of universities build and launch CubeSats. And we reference them in terms of unit, where each unit is a 10 centimeter cube. Uh, the most common CubeSats we have at AFRL are 3U, 6U, and 12U. So it'd be like three wind up or two of those three U's side by side to make like a rectangle or a 12U, which is twice that again. And the main benefit of this size of satellite is that it's um, cheaper to launch because they can catch a ride on another mission's rocket as a secondary payload. And with CubeSats, um, then, um, one of the bigger things that we wanted to kind of dive into. So we want, we know that like with DSX and other larger satellites, they are of, you know, equal importance in terms of uh, getting them up there for testing. But what are some of the benefits of using these more cost-effective, almost simpler, smaller CubeSats? Yeah, because of the, uh, the lower cost, the mission owners are willing to accept more risk on these satellites. And then because they're simpler, uh, it often requires smaller crews and less work to operate these. We have a whole branch in AFRL space vehicles that is dedicated to doing small sets. And something they're also focused on is ground system automation and a transition to virtual computing. Both of those are going to really simplify operations. Um, the only thing that we are concerned about is making sure that as we have fewer people monitoring the telemetry, we have a robust and automated notification system in place that will alert us to any abnormal telemetry at any hour of the day. Um, and then that capability for automatic notification, um, that allows the smaller teams to get away with not actually sitting in the op center 24 seven. So you mentioned that these satellites have less risk and that reminds me of a previous conversation we had on a podcast with uh, Major Michael Nyack about you know risk in space missions. AFRL supports the United States Air Force, seeing the traditional like flying planes that we think about this airspace and cyber, but you know, the United States Space Force too, we are the research laboratory for that as well. What can you tell me about risk in, in missions when we're talking about satellites? For us in the satellite world, I think you see a much stronger aversion to risk for many reasons. Um, I think in the world of air test, the risk posture is significantly uh, significantly different. There's a stronger desire to push the boundaries and determine exactly where the operating limits are and to, to characterize the edges of the envelope for that air vehicle. And you're applying those risks to a small number of air vehicles. And then your results affect, affect the flight rules of that whole, the whole line of that type of vehicle, which could be dozens or hundreds more vehicles. So if you do lose a vehicle in test, you're, you could kind of say you're amortizing that loss across many more vehicles. In our satellite world, there are long lead times to get a vehicle launched, and there's pretty much no report repairing your vehicle once it's on orbit. Um, so there's generally many fewer vehicles of a line number, even for vehicles like GPS, where there are many that are similar. And your costs of each vehicle are very high. So the natural response in the satellite world is that we tend to be risk averse and we tend to kind of fly the vehicles in the middle of the road and not push the boundaries, which is good. You know, there are pros and cons, obviously. We, it's good to be careful with our very precious, expensive vehicles, but we also often don't find the operating edges of what a vehicle could potentially do because we're not pushing those boundaries. It, it's also important, I think, to make the distinction between an operational vehicle and an ex experimental space vehicle. So operational vehicles are providing cons to guys on the ground, right? If you damage your vehicle, pushing it too far, you're risking their lives. And day-to-day -day operations for those vehicles can't really push the bounds of their capabilities. Um, the operators are not usually allowed to deviate very much from the checklist because the consequences of a misstep are too high. Um, and AFRL, we, have a little bit more luxury because our vehicles are designed and built and flown to be experiments. So we have the luxury of having a looser risk posture and we enable that ability to push the boundaries by integrating both our experimenters and our vehicle experts into the day-to-day -day activities. We also give the team a lot of authority to design the testing and manage the vehicle. 
So for example, our integration and test team who has been, um, you know, working with the satellite for a couple of years before launch and is really familiar with it, has run all the procedures and all the activities on it and tests, they come to our ops floor and they integrate as part of our operations crew. Um, so that's been a best practice for almost two decades in AFRL. And that gives us, you know, the vehicle expertise right at hand for the activities that we're accomplishing. I guess one more thing that we like to stress is that it's really important. So we have this great opportunity, right? We have a looser risk posture. We have these really fun experimental vehicles. And we have this mission to, you know, kind of eke the science out of these vehicles. So in order for us to actually get that done and get the most we can out of these vehicles, it's important that we have operators who are really proficient and who are very involved with that on-orbit testing. So we put a lot of emphasis on training. We train our operators in multiple different areas, you know, on the inner working through the vehicles and on some of their constraints and, you know, ops discipline, ops best practices. And then we encourage our teams to continue to learn the vehicle. And all of these are endeavors to try and make sure that, you know, when AFRL spends millions of dollars to put something on orbit, that we can, you know, get the most we possibly can out of that space experiment. And that's great. I mean, you really touched on a point I wanted to uh, kind of dive into more at the end a little bit with training. Um, I know I talked about earlier having that, you know, a satellite boot camp you guys help run to really train and uh, get people ready to work with a lot of these uh, life cycle, like you said, very uh, intensive experiments. But is there an idea then that you guys have with this um, full risk posturing? Are you starting to integrate this more and more into training or are there plans to work with people from like the test pilot school, for instance, to help uh, help change this mentality a bit to, like you said, really get the full purview or at least push the envelope as to what these satellites can do? I don't know if this answers the question exactly, but I would talk about some of the things that we are already doing at AFRL to mitigate risk. And one of those, I think, is used in operational squadrons as well. But what I would talk about is what we call safety nets, which is like scheduling a command to go off in the future that will return the vehicle to a safe state um, before we do something risky with the vehicle. So like I could schedule, okay, at 4 p.m., the vehicle is going to go back to its regular configuration. And then now it's noon. Now I'm going to do something that um, might further our experiment, but I may never talk to the vehicle again. And then I know that at four o'clock, I'll be able to talk to it again after that. Um, that can goes off on board. Another common example of a safety net is our just our regular communication schedule that we use on a daily basis on almost every mission. We know the transmitter is going to turn on at an expected time. Um, we have that programmed ahead of time. We program that daily. And then we have a person either on co on console or we have automation set up and ready to talk to it at those times. And like with test pilot school, they have um, the new space test fundamentals course happening at Edwards Air Force Base. I was actually recently selected for the inaugural offering of that course. And um, I guess whenever people are listening to this, I'll actually be there already because I'm leaving this weekend. And I'm hoping to bring back from that class a lot of knowledge about how to put together a robust spacecraft test plan, including before launch and also while we're on orbit, that also mitigates risk. But while I'm there, I also hope to contribute to the future curriculum of the same course. Um, I think it's supposed to be kind of mutually beneficial that way. Um, I think that there's a lot about the space environment and the current way that we do space operations in the military and especially at AFRL where we do experimental operations that the traditional instructors, the flying instructors at test pilot school may not fully understand yet. First, I will say congratulations. That is so cool. So we're definitely going to have to reconvene with you after this training's complete to kind of see what knowledge you have and what you can share with us. Because you're right, this could really uh, shake up the game for a lot of cool, um, like you said, this risk posturing, how you can set up these flight plans with satellites and hopefully uh, better be able to achieve these missions. But of course, like you said, staying within safety guidelines. Yeah, thanks. Definitely. 
And with that in mind too, like you mentioned a lot of this cool training going on. Um, something that I'm really learning here uh, with satellites that I wasn't even aware last we spoke was um, just how hands-on a lot of it is, like you mentioned with some of these uh, daily missions. I had no idea that you, like you'd said before, um, you guys are working and talking with the satellite pretty often to make sure you can update daily missions, kind of what it's looking to do, collecting data, of course. And um, the fact that you can actually set these future programs um, to say, if you want to test something out that's maybe a little past, uh, maybe a little further, push the envelope a bit, but have it returned to its original state is brilliant. So like I had a question that you kind of answered before about how AFRL is uniquely positioned uh, for risk adverse environments. It sounds like you guys already have some of this literally programmed in. Yeah. And Chris talked about earlier as well, our integration and test team um, is at our disposal here at AFRL. They sit on console with us. They can preemptively identify potential issues before they happen they can help us resolve anomalies on the spot. This team has been through tests with the vehicle and has seen a lot of symptoms of weird stuff happening prior to launch. And so like if they see those kinds of things again on orbit, they're the ones that are the most intimately familiar with those quirks of the vehicle or that personality, if you want to say that. And so that reduces the timeline for resolution for us, whereas an operational squadron uh, typically might have to reach like make a phone call back to the factory. They don't have those experts actually sitting on console like we do. And that has a positive impact on the outcome anomaly resolution and then just the amount of science that we're able to gather through these experiments. And then we also train our operators to have more intimate knowledge. One of the many uh, trainings that we give them is vehicle training, which is often presented by that integration and test team themselves. Um, and they can ask them any questions. And that, and that plays another role in getting things done and solving problems faster, that the whole team is kind of on the same page with what the vehicle can do and might do to them. So you're reacting quickly to uh, needs and situations. Can you control these satellites from home? That's funny that you asked that. We actually had a mission that, um, well, it launched this year and completed its mission this year called BPM, which is the Very Low Frequency, or VLF, propagation mapper. Um, it went up uh, to do experiments in conjunction with DSX. It was actually listening for DSX's transmissions. And that was the first cloud-based ground system we've done. The op center actually, uh, it started with wired systems, but for a time it actually had um, like the thing client in the operation system. The ground system on that was as much of an experiment as the vehicle. I think I mentioned that our small set branch has been working on pushing the boundaries of ground system experimentation. Um, and that one, after the coronavirus hit in March, everyone went home. And for a while, there were two people flying it in the op center. And they kind of said, I can connect to this from, to the, like, with, to the internet with my work computer. Um, I might as well just fly this at home. And so for most of the pandemic, it was flown at home. Um, in someone's basement. And so that was a pretty cool um, demonstration, um, kind of by force of a really, I don't want to say, like a really flexible ground system. How wild. I think about, you know, our historian and, you know, his archives of these momentous occasions in AFRL's history where researchers and scientists are doing things for the first time. And in this instance, it was in someone's basement. You know, if, if we had taken a picture to capture that moment, it was someone's basement. How crazy is that? Yeah, I hope you took a selfie or something, because that would be a great thing to add to our uh, history book. Yeah, I was going to say, it's momentous. So that's why it's really cool to catch up with both of you about all this cool stuff we're doing. So um, while we kind of start uh, rounding things out here, there's a big thing we want to touch on, um, which was uh, the work your team does with the Space and Missile Systems Center. So what does that partnership look like, or what do you guys do? So uh, the Space and Missile Assistance Center is just down the street from us here at Kirtland, and they have uh, an operations facility that is specifically devoted to experimental and prototype satellites. So we work with SMC to utilize some of their personnel, utilize their space, and we partner to fly at least the larger missions that we do here at a space vehicle. We've had a, this partnership with them for 20 years. We share operators, we train together. And then because we have that strong relationship, um, even when we're you know, not formally working together on a mission, we do a lot to help each other out with training or um, providing rehearsal coaching, things like that. We're also building a new 
support center for our upcoming flight experiments. And we're hoping that we can share that with SMC in the future as well. So the partnership has been very beneficial to both of our organizations. Thanks. And that makes sense. Really what helps make AFRL, and especially with space vehicles, so uh, prolific and so uh, it's so successful is a lot of these partnerships and people connecting at the right place and with the right people, uh, which is something we had discussed before, um, uh, the uh, interview before this, that we really wanted to make sure was um, talked about here, is uh, because both of you have, I mean, to be honest, some of the coolest jobs I've ever heard. Like working with satellites and in space is so neat, especially learning <laughs> about how uh, cool a lot of the systems are and the experiments you're doing. So um, we would love to hear from from students who may be interested in working in your field or even in the Space Vehicles Directorate, how can they connect with you? I'm glad you asked about that. Um, so last summer, we completed our first ever summer scholars program. Uh, even though that one ended up being remote because of the pandemic, um, the AFRL puts on the summer scholars program every year. It was just our first year getting connected with it. Um, and we do plan to do that every summer now. So um, high school through graduate students can apply um, to work with the operations cadre in particular via um, the AFRL Scholars Program. Um, and then if there are AFRL employees that are interested in getting involved in space operations at Kirtland specifically, we recruit volunteers to become crew members. So just be on the lookout for those announcements to go out um, or you can get in touch with us if you want to. Ken, someday when you get that house and a, and a dog and everything, you have to have a basement so you can you can crew from your basement for Chris and Evie. Hey, I'm just saying, if you guys need some help, I would love to get texted by satellites, whether it's Carl or Debbie, and help out where I can. Excellent. <laughs> well, it's really appreciated. Thank you both so much for meeting with us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to learn more about um, the vehicles you work on, satellites, and a lot of the training that goes behind it. And Evie, once your training is done, we'll love to reconnect with both of you to see how that might change the game for us. And we may have to have a separate uh, podcast about Miyazaki. So trust me, I've got a lot to say there. <laughs> Make sure to stop awesome. while we have time. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks for having us. Make sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. And remember, stay curious. Logging off.